Hello, everyone, and thanks for joining, and welcome to Webinar Wednesdays from CCFS. You're listening to Kathy Tabor, and I'm the Executive Director. Today's webinar is Emergency Responder Radio Communication Systems, presented by Craig Sells of CSLS. Um, just a little bit about C CFS before we get started. We're a national nonprofit member-based organization dedicated to campus fire safety since our beginnings in 1999. We're governed by a 12-person board of directors and they're located nationwide. The majority of our board and also our member base consists of fire marshals on a college or university campus, fire safety educators, inspectors, government officials, city and city fire departments with the responsibility for local or college or university. As a member, as a benefit to our members, we offer free webinars with CEUs. We offer discounts for training, access to online job board and listserv for networking purposes, a library of online international, on, online resources and a free e-magazine that's distributed internationally as well to about 17,000 people. Um, our activities include both virtual and in-person trainings and then special events through the year like Campus Fire Safety Month activities and our Campus Fire Forum, which we're looking forward to the first in-person event in three years, and that'll be in New Jersey this November. Um, now a little bit about housekeeping too. All the attendees are in listen-only mode. If questions arise, just type them in the control panel and our speaker will respond at the end of the webinar. Um, today's session includes ICC CEUs for one hour. You must be present for the entire webinar uh, to receive that. ICC certs will be added to your account on myccfs.org by the end of this week. And from there, you'll be able to print a certificate and add your, your credits into your own ICC account. Um, you'll get an email from us with directions on that, so you don't have to worry about it at this point. Um, CEUs are issued to members at no cost. Um, just important, if you are not a member and still want CEUs, please email this, please email your intent to support team at campusfiresafety.org. Um, the other thing too, if you can't hear or see anything in the webinar, if something goes wrong, just send me um, a message in chat, I will be there. And pretty soon I'm gonna stop talking, but I just wanna um, give you an overview of our presenter, Craig Sells of CSLS. Craig is a leading expert in designing and installing emergency radio, emergency responder radio communication systems with over a decade of experience. He is certified by the Florida Fire College in 2016 to teach AHJs on this subject matter due to assisting AHJs in being trained on what an ERRCS is and how to inspect them. Now, at this point, um, I'm going to turn everything over to Craig. Go ahead, Craig. Thanks. Kathy, thank you very much. I appreciate the introduction. Happy Wednesday to everyone. I greatly appreciate your taking the hour to join us today, and hopefully you'll find this to be of a benefit. As Kathy said, my name is Craig Sells. I'm a business partner with CSLS LLC. Uh, we've got over 10 years of experience in the design installation of emergency responder ready communication systems. Um, we actually work throughout the United States. Presently, we have active projects in eight different states in the country, uh, from California all the way to the state of Florida. And uh, if anyone has any questions, I've asked Kathy to make sure that we've got this presentation available to all of you after the presentation today. So getting into it, what is an emergency responder ready communication system? Um, one minute, I guess the tech is not working right. Buildings are designed and built with fire alarms as a norm. Uh, what about two-way radio communication for first responders inside the building? The most probable cause of 
first responder to an incident in any building that's a medical emergency? What if the patient in trouble was you and the first responders were aren't able to speak on the radios? In 9-11, over 400 firefighters lost their lives in part to radio communication failure. Most people are unaware of the fact that emergency responder radio communication systems came as a byproduct of the National Security Council that was put together after the 9-11 incident. The reason why they were able to ascertain that the radios for the firefighters inside of Tower 2 failed was that when firefighters actually are in a mass potential casualty situation, they have very strict protocols in which they follow. Uh, one of the last protocols before they evacuate the building is to get civilians in groups of 10 to walk with a firefighter out of the building to be escorted. Um, unfortunately, the radios did not work. Uh, when, the rec when the search party went back in, they found the people, the civilians were in groups of 10 with the firefighters waiting for the call to come in on the radios. Well, skipped a little bit, sorry about that. Um, public safety radio. Uh, reliable radio coverage is a necessity of lives depend on it. So going into the unknown, will my two-way radio work in this building? And although these are pictures of firefighters, this actually, two-way radios are utilized by first responders, including police, obviously sheriffs, paramedics, and firefighters. In 2017, a survey was done by the IFC of 1,001 different first responders. And the questions are actually categorized in four questions here, starting with the upper left-hand corner. The question there was the percentage of buildings with poor radio frequency coverage. And of the respondents, there were 574 firefighters that responded. And of those, 98.5% of them said that they had poor coverage with their radios inside of the building, EMS 84, police 64. Um, it was, became very evident in the next question as we go to the right on the upper right-hand corner that the level of expertise with this subject matter, 5% of them had no idea what this was, 26% were not aware of this topic. And you see the 32% had some training and 18% were plan reviewers and did some inspection, 16%. Uh, and in the bottom left-hand corner, have you experienced communications failure within a building during an emergency incident? And 56% of them in the last six months when the survey was done had actually experienced an incident where the radios did not work inside the building. Um, and reliable in-building communication of uh, LRMR during emergencies, 94% of them considered to be a critical. So what causes the problems with the two-way radios? Um, my corporate office is actually based in Boca Raton, Florida, but we actually we travel around the United States. Regardless of what market you might be dialing in from today, everyone is impacted by the building materials in the last 25 years have actually strongly gone toward utilization of LED products. Um, LED products are great, but just like the picture of the building to the right there, that's e-glass. That e-glass is great for keeping up the solar energy and making sure that we're getting high efficiency within the buildings. But also at the same time, it eliminates our signals from being able to get inside of the building itself. In the upper left-hand corner, we see a picture of a LED rating. Uh, this building's got a C with a 60 rating. And in the upper right-hand corner, which is very interesting, and this is really important when we're doing a design for a system, is we can see how much attenuation we get per different product that's utilized in the design and installation of a bit new construction building. We also do the same thing with pre-existing buildings. So whenever we're actually working with potential clients, we always ask for this information because the more information we get from architectural floor plans, the better off we can actually prepare the design to ensure that's going to be compliant when it's fully installed. One of the big issues that we run into is signal to noise ratio. Uh, so uh, many of you probably remember the commercial, can you hear me now? That's applicable when it comes to two-way radios. In a two-way radio, if you're in a, an environment that doesn't have a lot of people there and, and it's fairly quiet, it's a lot easier to hear in your two-way radio. However, if you're in a noisy environment, like a nightclub here, you can imagine the effort that it takes to be able to hear 
as people are trying to make a radio call. And what is a, we call it SINAR as the abbreviation, and that's signal to interference and noise ratio. It's a measurement of signal quality. The strength of the wanted signal compared to the unwanted interference at the noise and noise. And again, can you hear me now? So what impacts a SINAR in a, in a DAS? And DAS is an acronym, if you're not familiar with it, it stands for Distributed Antenna System. The things that impact the signal to noise ratio are low donor signal coming into the VDA. And the VDA is a bidirectional amplifier, which we'll talk about here shortly. Uh, we also are impacted by elevated environment noise. Other RF signals such as cellular DAS can actually have an impact on it if it's not designed correctly. Uh, electrical equipment can actually cause a lot of issues. Thing that we refer to as multipath is a delay between the direct and indirect RF paths of the signal coming from the towers in the area. Um, class A VDAs with narrow channels can create too much propagation delay, which is part of the design consideration we, we need to address. A low quality BDAs, BDA should have five dB or less of noise figure with improper installation. Uh, if an integrator that does the installation doesn't know what they're doing and they install it incorrectly, the system can create oscillation. And there's a lot of issues around the country where we're hearing from AHJs that are saying that the system and their jurisdiction wasn't installed correctly. And the impact can actually be far reaching. Uh, in South Florida back in 2017, there was an incident where an integrator installed a system. That system ended up taking down seven jurisdictions, which was Miami-Dade County and Broward County, all the local municipalities within those counties. It took three days for the radios to get back online. So in important terms, uh, and this is more applicable for when you're doing an installation and for fire marshals that are out there doing inspections on the installations, uh, VISWAR is an acronym that we use frequently. It's the Voltage Standing Wave Radio, Ratio, sorry. And it's a measurement of the efficiency of the radio frequency power that is being transmitted from a power source. So basically, if we consider the at the macro level, it's the towers that we see along the road that we're receiving the signal from, and at the micro level, it would be where we're installing a bidirectional amplifier system and receiving that signal and transmitting back to the tower. Uh, AGCs are automatic gain control, uh, which is a closed loop feedback regulating circuit and amplifier or chain of amplifiers. Uh, we look at AGC on the receiving side, and below that you'll see ELC, which is automatic level control, and that's actually on the transmit side. So key terms, it gets really heavy into the science. I don't wanna get too far down the road on that, but if you have any questions on that, please feel free to reach out to me. So the coverage problem, um, as I said a moment ago, we're receiving the frequencies, the signal I should say, from the towers that are in the area. So in, in the diagrams here, we show the tower on the far left side, that's the repeater that's actually sending signals out in the 360 degree radius from the tower source itself. And if we're in the building in the diagrams, whether it's the office building on the left or the school on the right, the problem we got into is that on one side of the building, you might have really good coverage, but then as the signal has to travel through that building, and we showed a few slides before, that all the building material that actually, you know, concrete and steel, e-glass, even drywall, can cause attenuation we're losing the signal. So by, by the time we get to the other side of the building, you see in the diagrams, we've got poor coverage. So what's the solution? Uh, the solution actually is installing an emergency responder radio communication system. Uh, in the decade that I've been working in this field, I think I'm aware of at least 30 different names of what this is called. Um, depending upon the jurisdiction that I go to, We'll also see the local jurisdiction refer to it as different names. BDA is frequently what's called, what's used in the industry, but BDA is deceptive because BDA is actually only the brains of the system itself. So the BDA receives and transmits the signal out onto what's called the directional amplifier system, and that's the DAS. And in the pictures here, it shows the different components that are basically make up that DAS. We showed in the very beginning of the slide that in 9-11, um, uh, the National Security Council had actually put together and they did the assessment. They realized what the problems were. 
we really didn't see until 2012 any mention of the code and it came out originally in the pa1 in subsection i'm sorry in chapter 11 subsection 10 and it talks about the two-way writing communication enhancements in that section there um so and then it, just at the bottom of this page in 2021 nfpa1 the first committee draft included requirements for listing to ul 2524 uh, at the beginning of this year we also saw the uh, nfpa 1225 code came out so every three years nfpa has given us new revisions of the code and it's changed and we'll talk about that here in a few slides as well so depending upon what part of the country you were you were in, um, like for instance, the state of Florida actually really only utilizes NFPA code, but we do a lot of work in California and Texas and other areas, and they actually lean heavily on IFC. So the International Building Code of 2015, if you look at section 916, and of course we mentioned a moment ago, the NFPA one, so the section 1116, uh, referred to the state recognized fire code uh international fire code section 510 and it's still in section 510 if you're not familiar with that uh it first appeared in 2012 and we've seen we're new updated versions of that code since that point in time uh we actually just saw the 2018 come out a few years ago now in 2021 uh, NFPA 72, which is National Fire Alarm and Signaling Code, the 2013 edition was when we saw it in Section 24.5.2. NFPA 72 is still around. Now, as I look go down to the third one there, we talk about NFPA 1221. Most states right now, if you're actually including NFPA, would actually refer to both 72 and 1221. Um, but there is 1221 has been absorbed as of this year by NFPA 1225. So we still have NFPA 72. Now we have this new code, NFPA 1225. The other thing, codes that we need to look at when we're actually putting together a system and installing it are the National Electrical Code as well. The code provisions change every cycle. There's, we, those of us in the industry really still consider this to be the wild, wild west. Um, even though it's been around now for almost a decade, as far as the codes are concerned, uh, you're going to be very hard pressed to find the drawings that actually include a emergency responder rated communication system inside the drawings. We also have, uh, if you look at the code themselves and do a side by side comparison, such as this chart with NFPA 72. We have the 2013, 2016, and 2019 codes side by side here. Um, there's been a lot of changes. There have been changes as far as the in-building requirements. There has been a lot of changes as far as pathway survivability for the coaxial cable required. Um, within the last, just under a couple of years, we've actually seen that as far as cabling is concerned, we have a new product, it's UL2196 listed, that many jurisdictions have adopted and they're allowing us to utilize that in the design which eliminates a lot of the conduit that we may otherwise have been required to utilize um, there are instances and many instances for that matter that we still do have to utilize conduit included in the design uh, plenum rated coaxial cable uh, we've got different types of coax that are available today that one that started a decade ago and the manufacturers are working diligently to actually create new products to keep up with the ever-changing fire code demands and as we're learning different things in the industry what we need to do to make make these things work we've got lightning protection requirements originally in 2013 as it says it wasn't even addressed uh, now it's a ver very big item to be looking for so if you're an AHJ we need to make sure that we're actually addressing these things um, the isolation of the donor antenna we've got in 2013, you only had to have 15 dB of isolation. Uh, in 2016, you saw the introduction of 20 dB, and in 2019, it was also 20 dB. We have the battery backup required. Uh, you see the changes there as well. So I, I don't want to spend a lot of time going through every one of those, but this gives you a really good idea of the changes that have taken place over the last several years. And we see that on the IFC side of code as well. 
uh, as I mentioned a moment ago, we it's still in Section 510. Um, again, if you look at the second one down, the pathway survivability for the co coaxial cable, it was not specifically addressed in 2015. However, when we look at the 2018 and 2021, there are sections of the code that are dedicated to actually addressing survivability, and it's a really important component of this whole. Um, and so, again, I'll go ahead and skip through this a little bit. So when we're designing a system, one of the crucial points that we need to look at are what are the frequencies for the public safety radios that we need to design this for? And we've got VHF, UHF, 700 and 800 megahertz. Um, so VHF and UHF are really kind of the antiquated frequencies that we see. But even though they're antiquated, we still have a lot of jurisdictions within across the United States. And we've got a project in California right now that's kind of in the center portion of the state that uh, they only have VHF and UHF and we actually have to design and install a system that marries those signals together um, through different components we use within the installation that allows them to utilize both of those bands of the frequencies. One of the things that we utilize to be able to figure out, um, there is a mathematical calculation for uplink that's based on downlink. Um, if we look at NFPA 1225, which is the new code that came out this year, the committee that actually drafted that spent a lot of time evaluating how, do, how can we get better data to make the assessment on whether or not a building truly needs to have a system installed. And based on that, they, uh, they really haven't still allowed the calculation per se but there's a lot more acknowledgement in the industry that there is in fact a calculation we can get to that point and mathematically prove that if we have a signal level or a certain level of uplink when we hit the tower because most people don't realize in order to actually get uplink you have to have someone standing at the tower as well as someone at the building and the person at the tower is going to be receiving the signal that's coming from the person in the building so if you're at the tower well, the only people that have authorization to be at the towers are the AHGAs and those that work on the system itself. So it's really important to have these kinds of tools available to us. So that all falls back into what we call an RR signal survey, a radio signal survey, if you would. And a radio signal survey allows us to make a determination based on the data that's been collected on whether or not a building needs to have a system installed. So what we do is it, on the bottom of the side, we actually show all your floor plan. And by code, we're required to actually have a minimum of 20 readings per floor. The current code states that each grid can have, can the minimum size per grid is a 20 foot by 20 foot. The maximum size is 80 feet by 80 feet. Uh, we work on a lot of very large um, distribution centers. One in California I mentioned a moment ago is a 3.8 million square foot distribution center. So you can imagine if your maximum grid is an 80 by 80, just how many grids you're actually going to have. So moving forward, NFPA 1225 section A, I'm sorry, uh, table, uh, that A.18.9, a better indicator of proper system performance and coverage is to use DAQ audio quality measurement system. So this came out in this year's code for 1225. Um, the table on the left actually, it, it's a very subjective test. It's a delivered audio quality test. And unfortunately, those of us that have been in the industry for any period of time probably all agree that DAQ is a very poor measurement to actually figure out whether or not an area is qualified, if it's in compliance or not. Um, if you look on the right-hand side, this is actually a table that comes out of the uh, Telecommunications Industry Association, Table A.1 A. in the TSB-88 standard. And in that standard, it actually shows that there is a direct correlation with bit error rate compared to DAQ. So when we talk about how to quantitatively assess whether or not a building needs to have a system, 
bit error rate was considered to be one of the measuring values when they were evaluating how to draft 1225. The problem to it is that there is only really one spectrum analyzer on the market today that has the ability to measure the bit error rate. And so we cannot draft a code that only allows one manufacturer's product to be utilized. Now, other manufacturers are emulating what that one's doing and they are coming up to speed, but that's the present state of the market. So in the typical deployment process, the typical deployment process, we go through uh, each of the words in red kind of highlights what each portion of that is. And we start out with the design. So anytime that a, uh, a client may come to me and say, hey, Craig, I, we need to look at potentially having a system installed. The first thing that we always ask for are the architectural floor plans. Um, the architectural floor plans can get us part, with, part way there. Um, the picture at the bottom of this page is actually from IB Wave. And IB Wave is the industry standard software program that allows us to do modeling to see when we're designing a system based on the building materials that are being used. And then at some point, we'll do an initial RO signal survey and marry that information into the modeling program itself and come out with a very accurate depiction of what we need to have as far as equipment and where antennas need to be mounted inside of a building to bring that building into compliance. As I mentioned a moment ago, this, is, this kind of gives you two pictures here of what IB wave modeling may look like. Um, it truly is the uh, the industry standard as far as the modeling is concerned. There are a lot of jurisdictions that actually dictate that this is modeling that they're going to be looking for as part of the, uh, they want to see heat maps and they want to be able to see what the design looks like when we're going in for permitting these jurisdictions. Uh, it's, it's a great tool that we utilize to be able to really make sure we've got accurate designs. So within the industry, we really have two different types of DAS. We have what's called a passive DAS, and passive DAS, for the most part, is used in uh, small to medium uh, buildings, typically of buildings 500,000 square feet or less. Um, it can be used in buildings as long as it does not have a large amount of metal, masonry, or concrete wall materials blocking the RF signal. So sometimes we've got a smaller footprint of a building, but we still have to go to a fiber DAS or an active DAS because the passive just doesn't have enough gain that we can utilize to be able to really overcome the, uh, the coverage issues might, we might have inside of the building. Uh, passive DAS only uses coaxial cable where we don't actually utilize fiber in that solution. Uh, it's also the smallest, simplest, and least expensive DAS solution to implement. The alternative and really applicable to with campuses, the best solution out there for any campus environment is going to be a what we call an active DAS or a fiber DAS. And if you look on the upper left-hand picture, we've got several buildings that are located here. Many times we'll go into a campus environment and a lot of campuses you'll have uh, dark fiber available. The requirement that's needed for interconnecting the buildings, we have to utilize single mode fiber. Uh, so long as we have single mode fiber, we only need a few strands. Uh, it's really just a, we prefer to have a home run for wherever, wherever we may mount the master unit. And typically we mount that master unit in the tallest building because that's also where we're gonna show, and you'll see the donor antenna mount on the top of the building and the building on the far left. Um, AHJs really appreciate when we utilize fiber DAS, especially in a campus environment, because one of their great concerns are that they don't want to have too many donor antennas facing their towers, because the more antennas they have like, facing their towers, there's a lot more potential for interference and the other issues that could have negative consequences on the macro system. And from a cost perspective, if you're one of the, uh, if you're looking at putting a system on your campus, you'll end up saving a lot of money going down the road of a fiber DAS rather than trying to do what we call either a standalone or a passive DAS. So what are the DAS components? When we actually get into doing the installation here, um, you'll see couplers, you've got a filter potentially, you've got the BDA down on the bottom. Um, there's two different, depending upon the jurisdiction, some jurisdictions say we've got to mount the bidirectional amplifier, either 
in the fire controlment room or as close to the fire control room as possible, uh, which always will be on the ground floor. There are other jurisdictions, however, that recognize the bi-directional amplifier is best served if it's located on the top floor of the building because the donor incentive is going to be that much closer to the BDA and it's also not as costly of an installation. So, and then we also have the couplers, the two-way splitters inside the, uh, so because what we need to do is each one of these antennas that we put inside the building, we actually have to do what's called a link budget to be able to manipulate the signal strength that's coming out or being fed to each one of these antennas to ensure that the system is going to be balanced. And the goal is that every one of these antennas inside the building actually have the same gain at the antenna as all the others. That gives us the, uh, the ability to make sure that it's balanced and that the antenna that's furthest away from the bidirectional amplifier will still have the signal strength necessary for the communication. The other component that's really important that's required is a battery backup unit. And code requires at this point a NEMA 3 battery backup unit. Depending upon the jurisdiction that you're in and whether or not the building has a level one generator, you either have to provide 12 hours of battery backup or 24 hours of battery backup. And of course, we've already mentioned the donor antenna that's on top of the building. The key component to the donor antenna are doing the installation. We want the donor antenna to be on the leading face of the building that's receiving the signal from the tower itself. It's really important that we don't put this donor antenna on the opposite side of the building because it can create what we refer to as oscillation. So a typical new construction installation is a picture on the left. Um, the bidirectional amplifier is actually the one on the, in the center upper. The battery backup unit is actually on the bottom. Comba happens to be one of the manufacturers. There are many manufacturers in the industry. Uh, CSLS is manufacturer agnostic, which happens to be a good picture here. And we're going to get into in a few slides here the monitoring of the bidirectional amplifier and BBU. The uh, you'll notice there are seven relays that are actually monitoring the system. It's being monitored by the fire alarm control panel. But the BDA itself, it's really important to know what the local requirements are. There are jurisdictions that require us to use a Class A. Um, and, and the characteristics of that Class A, it's got a 6.25 kilohertz, it's narrow band. Um, we actually need to program the BDA with the frequencies for that jurisdiction. Uh, whereas a class B is a broadband. So it's 250 kilohertz, it's got two wideband filters, it's contiguous. Now, one of the things we're going to jump into in a moment as well is that when you're dealing with a class B, if you opt to go the class B route, and it is less expensive to do a class B, the class B has to be registered with the FCC. The other components we've spoken about, the donor antenna and the coaxial cable, so I don't want to spend a lot of time discussing that right now. Um, this gives you a picture of some of the splitters and couplers that we utilize, the RF connectors. RF connectors are extremely important. It's probably the most overlooked component installed inside of a system. If a RF connectors are not properly seated and installed, they can actually create what's called PIM. And ultimately, the larger the building, the larger the system that's being installed, if you don't actually have good connector continuity and they're, they're not seated correctly, what can happen is that you can lose too much signal as a result of those connectors not being tight and the system may very well fail. You've got a battery backup unit in the upper right-hand corner. Uh, it shows you some of the batteries. Now, batteries have to be replaced every three years. Um, so anytime you're doing an installation, we always make sure that we label those batteries for the day of installation. That way, three years from time from that duration, we actually go ahead and make sure we replace them. And the bottom is a picture of an enunciator panel. Uh, as I've already stated, there are seven points that are monitored, and we'll get into the monitoring in a moment as well. Uh, the, this picture actually shows us the seven points. We have the donor antennas being uh, monitored, as well as the RF emitter fire, low battery, system component power, AC power, battery charger, and fire alarm communication link. This is a typical diagram of a, a system that's been installed. 
this particular one, the bidirectional amplifier is on the top floor and it has 24 volts of battery backup power. This is a, a picture, uh, we did this one for when we did the UHF and VHF. Um, this Yagi, we, whenever you've got the two different Yagis, you gotta make sure that there's enough distance between the two that they don't actually create issues for one another, which again can lead to oscillation. Uh, in the middle there, you see a, a junction, a NEMA 4 rated junction box that's mounted to a, a parapet wall. And inside of that, we uh, we always have a polyphaser inside there that we've got surge suppression to ensure that we don't have lightning being introduced to the building. And then it's gonna be grounded to lightning ground on the building itself. In the state of Florida, and we work in Texas and a lot of other states that actually have to deal with hurricanes. Um, we always wanna make sure we've got the proper wind rating. So my office, as I mentioned, is in Boca Raton. We're actually in an area that requires us to, if we're close to the beach, the Yagi antenna has to be mounted to the building and have a uh, 180 wind rating, mile per hour wind rating on it. This is the other really big part. One of the greatest areas that we're always gonna find when doing an RF signal survey that does not have coverage and where we need that coverage is gonna be inside the elevator. One of the things that have been adopted within the state of Florida and many other jurisdictions around the country is the state elevators offices are allowing for elevator variance letters to be drafted. That's typically done through elevator contractor and we would support them in this to petition to the state the necessity to get an elevator variance letter to allow us to install a Yagi antenna in either the elevator pit or on the overhead. And normally it just needs to be done in the elevator pit because the higher up you go in a building, you typically have a much better signal because there's less obstructions in the surrounding area of the building itself. This is a detail of what that elevator uh, pit installation may look like. This is pretty typical. We've got a NEMA box there. Uh, it's got a the Yagi, it's a directional antenna that actually is mounted because it's facing straight up. We just need that signal to go straight up. And in this application, it does give us pretty good infiltration um, into the cab to ensure we've got signal there. We mentioned over in an earlier slide, NFPA 1221. And NFPA 1221, though now it's under 1225, uh, it's still extremely important because most jurisdictions have this as part of the active code requirements designed to and what the system will be inspected to as well. And so it's really important to ensure that whenever we go out and we're actually dealing with that jurisdiction, that we are installing the system in such a way that we're gonna find ourselves that we've, we've got, you either have level one, level two, or level three survivability. Um, one of the things we run into in, in recent, in the past year, I would say, are a lot of this can be driven by what type of fire sprinkler has been installed inside of a building. So if we're dealing with a residential multifamily building where they use an R13 uh, fire sprinkler, we're gonna be required to actually install to level two survivability for the entire system. Um, we can then petition the local HJ to utilize NFPA 1225, which eliminates part of the conduit requirements, but then it actually is more strict as far as the vertical riser for where we have our uh, our donor antenna and the DAS going up to feed it to the floors. This is an inspection checklist. And I, I think what's really important, one of the things that we're starting to see, and I travel around the United States doing inspections now, um, unfortunately, there's been kind of a lapse in a lot of jurisdictions where systems may have been installed in the last several years, but there's not been an annual inspection performed. Um, as I've already shown in several slides so far, the code is consistently changing. And so what was compliant back a few years ago um, may not actually, but typically it isn't actually in compliance today. That is not so much the issue. The challenge we run into more often than not is that when inspectors were going out four or five, 10 years ago and doing an inspection, the level of knowledge and training that they had at that point in time versus what they have today is vastly different. So if they were doing an inspection you know, five years ago, what they may have allowed to pass five years ago 
may not have had survivability. It may not have had lightning protection addressed. It, it, a lot of these items that show up on these lists are things that were never put, taken into consideration. Unfortunately, frequently, what we see is that the AHA, the inspector that went inside the building to inspect the system, they went inside, they keyed up on the radios, and the radios happened to work, and they didn't actually look at the rest of the items that are listed here on these inspection sheets. And again, all this is available as a, a PDF. So what are the concerns? What, what is an AHJ concern about from integrators that are doing installations? Now, around the United States, we're seeing that fire alarm contractors are installing these, We've got electrical contractors installing on them. We have integrators. Uh, from integrators, we oftentimes see that it was a cellular DAS integrator that tries to make the transition over to start doing what we collectively call public safety DAS. And as a result of that, there's a lack of knowledge by a lot of the integrators as far as how these systems are to be installed. So we see a lot of improper installations. We see things like noise on the uplink, failure of a system component. And obviously there's just competency. Um, a lot of people are jumping in because they see that it's an opportunity. They don't necessarily know what they're doing. And each one of these pictures shows different types of failures in each of these installations. Are they regulated? Uh, and this is a key thing, they are regulated. And as I've said, manufacturers have gone a long way and the UL is actually working with the manufacturers to ensure that we've got products available to us that are actually trying to keep up with as quickly as this industry is moving. Um, in part UL 2524, there are manufacturers out there that were ahead of the curve as far as this was concerned. And they were the first to get the UL 2524 in the bi-directional amplifier. That's become a norm within the manufacturers. The most recent UL2196, which is actually pertinent to uh, armor coaxial cable that has a 2R rating to it. That way you, you don't necessarily need to have conduit. So it's consistently changing. And then, of course, the FCC oversees all of this. Um, we're seeing a lot of things change in the industry that actually is being adopted to try to ensure that there are more and more hurdles for people to become that they have to attain to justify that they're qualified to do the installations. Um, FCC was one of the first, there's a grow license. And the grow license, your, that's your general radio telephone operator's license, uh, certifications by the manufacturers, things like that. But the, the FCC, as I said earlier, is also accountable for if we've got a class B signal booster we're installing, then I as the integrator, the grow license holder, I need to go to that FCC website and register that signal booster with them. There are a lot of jurisdictions that if it's class B, they then turn around and they will ask me for the signal booster FCC certification information and showing them that it was in fact certified, I'm sorry, listed with the FCC, registered. Um, installer requirements, you know, more and more of the HQs are are accepting of this, they're, they're looking at the you know, register license of certified uh, within the state of Florida itself. There's a state license that we can get. It's the two-way radio license installed. Um, nationally recognized certifications, we've got NYSIT. NYSIT just came out with uh, different tiers that you can test to to get your certification I mean, NYSIT certified on two-way radios. Um, emergency responder radio communication systems, of course, all the main manufacturers offer uh, certification on their BDAs because that is a requirement to actually be able to utilize and install their system. Um, and then we've already spoken about the verification. And it's really important that AHJs and each of the municipalities ask for these certifications to confirm that the integrator is in fact qualified. Uh, we spoke about 25, 24, and this is a little bit of an older slide, but I want to leave in the slide deck just so there's still a lack of understanding as far as what is exactly meant by UL 2524, what does it look like? Um, it's safety, it's a risk of fire, and risk of shock requirements of construction and testing, uh, compliance with specific performance requirements according to the IFC 2018 and NFPA 1221 in the 2019 edition. It's still in the 2025, I'm sorry, 1225 code. Um, reliability performance requirements applicable for life safety systems of construction and testing product marking installation and documentation. Um, one of the key parts of UL 2524 that when they're testing 
a bidirectional amplifier that UL is looking for, one of the third parties doing UL testing, is oscillation suppression and noise suppression. And then under each of those categories, it kind of gives you an idea of what they're looking for. Uh, the BDA detects oscillation, reduces gain in 5 dB steps until no further oscillation. The bidirectional amplifier sends trouble signal to the fire alarm control panel. Does the bidirectional amplifier indicate trouble or remote enunciation? Uh, the bidirectional amplifier continues normal operation with the maximum allowable gain. Uh, and then, of course, on the noise suppression side, is they normally generate a small amount of noise when idle. Cumulative effect of all this noise raises the noise floor on a frequency, and that can have it. That's where we really get into the potential impact on a macro system because that noise can be transferred, transmitted, I should say, back to the macro, the tower itself, and that's where we see towers fail. Um, one of the really interesting things, and it's available. I've got a YouTube channel, and you can go on there and see the video. When the U Underwriters Laboratory was testing under UL 2524, they actually take a, a fire hose and they spray down the bidirectional amplifier for 24 hours consistently. And what they do is they, they paint the inside of it pink. And so if any of that pink leaks outside of the bidirectional amplifier, it fails. Uh, the technical requirements that are addressed inside UL 2524, we've spoken about most of this already, but Again, if you want to have the slide deck and look further into this, I want to make sure this information was available to you. The other part, and we've spoken on, we mentioned this already, um, system monitoring. And under 2013 NFPA 72, there were only five points that the uh, dedicated panel had to monitor. And when we finally get to the 2016 edition of the NFPA 1221, that's where that information was located at in Chapter 9, Subsection 16, Subsection 2 is where the dedicated panel now states that we've got seven points we need to be in the monitor. That's Those seven points are still looked at in the 1221 for 2019 and now on NFPA 1225 here in 2022. There are jurisdictions around the United States, I know in California we run into this up in the, uh, the Bay Area, that they want us to be able to monitor the entire system. And by that they're saying, they want to know whether or not an antenna, one antenna inside the DAS itself goes down. How can we know whether or not that actually is working or not? And so there are a few different things that have come about. One of the real key that we're seeing utilized is RFID, RFID tags. And so there's just an electrical pulse that actually goes back to another component that's installed at the head end. And it reads for each of the antennas that are installed in the system. If not all the antennas transmit back, it'll send up a supervisory saying, wait a minute, I don't see all the antennas. Annual inspections. I think, as I said, I in the last six months, my company's probably done about 30 annual inspections. And unfortunately, none of those inspections have passed, which kind of puts it into perspective just uh, how far we have to come to ensure that systems are being installed and correct correctly today and I think it's a really pressing issue with a lot of jurisdictions around the United States right now. What are they going to do to resolve the lack of being compliance today for the systems that were installed back however many years ago that may have been? Um, because there are a lot of instances out there, and I'm going to actually go jump to the next slide here. These are pictures of some of the uh, instant annual inspections we've done. Yeah, people were installing systems in IDF rooms. They weren't putting them. You're supposed to install a system inside of a two hour fire rate room um, or design the components that are going to the bidirectional amplifier to be two hour fire rated and have that survivability. So we see it frequently on older systems that was not taken into consideration. There was no protection that's been provided on these cables. Um, there's also an issue we have as far as the battery backups are, are concerned. So we see that a lot of the uh, integrators that did installations in years past, they may have been utilizing a UPS. Um, well, UPS is not allowed. A UPS does not give the power. It's not. It doesn't have the NEMA 3 rating. Uh, it's not allowed per code. So if you see that, if somebody approaches you and says, hey, I want to install it this way, that is an incorrect way of doing the installation itself. 
the cables themselves need to be actually in conduit or have a an armored rating cable to us. There's level one, there's level two survivability listed cabling that has an armor around it to ensure that we actually meet level one and level two survivability. Um, again, we've got connectors that are not being protected. The, the picture on the far left here, they actually brought their lightning surge protector into the building itself. They don't even have it tied off to the building. It's actually hanging just below the bi-directional amplifier in that picture. Uh, in the middle picture here, we actually see a, a donor cable going to the donor antenna, just basically strung across the roof line. Uh, no protection whatsoever. We also run into issues where there's not any uh, fire caulking. So if the integrators don't know what they're doing, and unfortunately, if the inspectors haven't had the education, they don't necessarily know to look for these things. So as Kathy mentioned at the beginning of my presentation, I travel around the United States doing training for AHJs. I, I was initially certified by the Florida Fire College, and I've actually been working with the National Fire Marshal Inspector Association to uh, do training across the United States, wherever the AHJs may ask us to go to do this. But again, you can readily see in these pictures that there are a lot of issues, and th these are all within the last six months. So people are not recognize it. There's also a lack of understanding as far as the National Electrical Code. Uh, we have to abide by fill requirements whenever we're utilizing conduit. You can't exceed 55% of the fill capacity of the conduit itself. Um, we see, unfortunately, we still see people that are trying to utilize cellular bidirectional amplifiers for public safety, and that's also not allowed. Um, and we just get into a lot of deficiencies in these pictures as far as equipment not being mounted in the proper locations and then therefore the potential of bringing like in the far right hand corner lightning being brought into the building itself and this could potentially cause a fire the other really key important thing to talk about is going to be first net first net is actually if you're not familiar with it it was a contract that was awarded to at&t back in 2015 to create a national um based on sire telephony system for first responders to be able to communicate across the United States. Uh, AT&T has made great strides in the last seven years of uh, installing the necessary equipment to make FirstNet available throughout the United States. It's now left for the most part to the local jurisdictions, the states themselves, to decide whether or not they're gonna opt in or opt out. We are required from the emergency responder communication system to install bidirectional amplifiers that are first net capable. Uh, it's really important if you're an AHJ to make sure that the BDAs that are being utilized in their cut sheets have the first net um, as part of the design of the system itself and it's compliant. So there's multiple stakeholders when we're talking about these systems. And of course, we most of you already know who those entities are. Uh, emergency services, government agencies, IT radio, building owners, contractors, radio systems. And the, then there's us in the middle, the wireless industries that we need to work with all of you to ensure that you're being protected and that in the process, the community is being protected by putting in systems that are compliant and they're gonna actually do what they're intended to do. So thank you for uh, allowing me to speak and I'm, I guess we're going to open it up Kathy to a Q&A session and for those of you interested please feel free to contact me my email and mobile number are listed there thanks Craig that was great thanks everyone um we may uh, we have some questions if we do end up going over the two hour um I mean the one hour um time frame don't worry this session is being recorded it will be sent to you at the end um probably no, no later than the end of this week. Um, so first question, and by all means, if you have questions as we go along, this would be your opportunity um, to please just type them in the question section. This one is from David. Why isn't an article of NFPA 70 identified in relation to the installation of such systems? It would seem articles 820 and or 725 would be identified. 
Um, I think to some degree they are, and I think the, the different committees are together right now are actually are recognizing that there's a serious lack of proper communication to all level all levels needed, whether it's the AHJ, it's the, the building owners, the campus people, um, you know, NEC 70, those are really important things to actually be addressing because we really are pulling from so many different types of code, whether it's a building code, whether it's a fire code, whether it's electrical code, marrying them all together to be able to put together these solutions. Even when we start looking at the telecommunications and the that industry, as far as their standards are concerned, um, I don't necessarily have a, a, a cut and dry answer to that question. However, I would say, if you want to email me afterwards, there are a lot of organizations that are involved with exactly trying to answer those types of things and then disseminate that information. Thanks, Craig. Um, and we have one more question. And I just want to say at this point, anybody that wants to speak, just raise your hand in the control panel. There's a little hand icon and I will unmute you if you have um, any questions. But for now, I'll read the the next question I have, and that might be the last, unless anyone wants to raise their hand or um, type in another question. Um, and I guess we can answer this pretty simply. How did you say we can get a copy of the slide deck? Um, as I said, uh, my email is there. I can email it to you if you have any questions, if you've got a project you might want some uh, assistance with. As I mentioned, we do work around the country and we are always available. We've got teams traveling. We, we're currently in eight different states, so we try to make ourselves readily available to anyone who may need it. And uh, Kathy, I think you said you were also going to be disseminating this presentation yep. in a couple of days. Yeah, we have. Uh, not only will you re all receive the um, copy of the um, recording, that includes the Q&A session, but you'll also, you, I'm not sure if you can download it now, you probably can. One of the handouts is the slide presentation in PDF format. So if you go to handouts and can download it, you can get it there. If for some reason that doesn't work, all of this will be posted on our website, um, again, by the end of the week. And uh, Kathy, you bring up, a, I, I forgot to mention, we're certified, we do a four hour CEU course for AHJs. And it, Kathy and I were speaking before we started the presentation today. It, I think I think the biggest challenge I have with putting together today's is we don't have an hour to be able to discuss this topic. And I'm used to doing a four hour presentation. So condensing it in 25% of the time of what we normally do, uh, we have a tremendous amount of information. So if you're an HJ or somebody really looking for a lot more, uh, we welcome the opportunity to discuss this with you further. Thank you. Thank you very much, Craig. I appreciate that. Um, and I just looked through and I don't see anyone's hand raised. We don't have any other questions. So um, at this point, Craig, if you have anything to say, if not, I will just um, sign off and uh, say my goodbyes. <laughs> I, <laughs> Kathy, I, I appreciate it. I just wanted to thank uh, the CCFS for allowing me to come and uh, do this presentation with you today. And I know how valuable everyone's time is, so thank you for making yourselves available to this. Well, thank you, and great job. And thank you, everyone, for attending. And um, um, if you need me, um, it's just C for Kathy, C Tabor, T-A-B-O-R, at campusfiresafety.org. If you want to go to our website and see other webinars or download um, anything from Craig, uh, it's just um, myccfs, M-Y-C-C-F-S dot org. And again, thanks everyone and thank you too, Craig. Thank you. Bye-bye.